Um, in the Gaelic language, we have um, an overall position for welcoming people. We say, Falchoroiv Galair, you are all very welcome. That means that we are uh, conservative in long lists of distinguished guests and having to read them out one after the other. So you can practice this for when you go back to your own countries. Falcha Roiv Galair, Agus Gadamahagiv, you're all very welcome and thank you. Now, I'm conscious um, that as we speak, that as Anya has referred to uh, at this moment, the um, President and the First Lady are joined in an interdenominational service in Boston uh, for those um, who were injured or who lost their lives or have, had, um, have, have been maimed as a result of an act of insanity uh, on Patriot Day when the marathon took place. And um, I spoke yesterday evening to um, Governor Patrick uh, in respect of offering again our uh, condolences and consolation and sympathy and understanding and indeed prayers uh, to the uh, people of Massachusetts and particularly Boston, which is such an Irish city. And we've offered any assistance that we can, if necessary, through our consulate in the United States. And I want you to know that we, um, we share that very strongly with our American colleagues as indeed we do with the as yet unfolding and um, terrible consequences of what happened in Texas. Let me begin by uh, welcoming you here to this historic building in Dublin Castle. For generations, some of the most significant events in this nation's history have unfolded here um, in this castle. In fact, it was here at the early years of the last century that the symbolic handing over of power from uh, the British Empire uh, to a fledgling state in its independence took place outside the main entrance that you walked in here. And in recent decades, uh, this building uh, has been the uh, occasion and witness to many significant moments in this country's evolution uh, since our membership of the uh, European Union uh, and issues that have happened since. It's a Gurmagat Falcher Oath, Aud Vera. You wear the chain well, sir. Um, and it's also uh, the, the location for the inauguration of the presidents uh, of Ireland in the main hall up here. Indeed, it's also the venue uh, where the Queen of England, Queen Elizabeth, uh, who spoke so, so stirringly here when she came on her visit uh, last year uh, in 2011, um, uh, speaking of. Uh, her, the first visit by a reigning monarch to Ireland in over a century, which, as she said, was uh, symbolic in so many ways, but was real in the sense of closing a circle of history. So uh, it's also been a venue that's important for us in the context of the European Union and our membership of it. Um, we hope that the next chapter that will unfold in transatlantic relations can be um, assisted by the work uh, that's conducted here. Since I had the opportunity to address the Embassy Conference last year, both the European Union and the United States have endured continuing economic challenges. Uh, here in Ireland, we have had to deal with a number of very difficult circumstances and have worked hard to bring about a new sense of stability uh, to our national situation. And using this hard-won stability as a base uh, to encourage future growth and job creation. And using that experience as a template that could be beneficial to Europe, uh, we identified our presidency priorities as stability, jobs and growth, those three pillars. And having worked hard to bring about a new sense of relative stability, it might be easy to fall into the trap of easing off of the necessary plans to grow our economies. There is no time for any complacency, and now is the time to make the big changes that will lead to new opportunities uh, for our people. And at a time when we continue to experience unacceptably high levels of unemployment and weak economic growth, the priorities of jobs and growth remain both central and vital. They are absolutely essential to securing the social and economic well-being both of Europe and of the United States. And that is why the Irish Presidency has put such a focus on the historic trade agreement between the United States and Europe. Now, many of you gathered here today 
will be key participants in shaping the agreement that everybody looks forward to with a sense of, uh, sense of excitement and a sense of eagerness. This is a time for leadership. This is a time for conviction. It's a time for vision and it's a time for courage. The benefits of the EU-US trade agreement will drive new enterprise, create more jobs and solidify the EU-US relationship as the economic engine of the world. It will also have the potential to set down global conditions for trade and trading relationships. And as you all know, we are already starting from a very strong base. The EU and the US already enjoy the most integrated economic relationships in the world. And together our economies account for almost 50% of the world's GDP and contribute to almost a third of global uh, trade flows. The transatlantic economy generates five trillion dollars, five trillion dollars in total commercial sales a year and employs up to 15 million workers. And together this represents the largest and the wealthiest market on the planet, accounting for three quarters of global financial markets and over half of world trade and world GDP. That's an extraordinary base to be able to develop from. And yet despite the strength of our existing relationship, there is still enormous, enormous untapped potential in EU-US trade relations. If we can successfully unleash this potential, we will undoubtedly derive economic benefits in terms of growth and jobs on both sides of the Atlantic. Closer engagement and closer cooperation also brings new ideas, new energy, new innovation. Together, the EU and the US are already at the forefront of research and development and in developing new technologies. I see that every week here in the energy and the excitement of working in multinationals and servicing companies that are actually creating the future that is coming at us with bewildering speed. And by investing in that EU-US uh, trade potential, we're not only creating jobs in the short term, we're also ensuring the long-term sustainability of our economy's competitiveness and helping to secure a far more prosperous future for our peoples with far greater stability. And given all of these economic and enormous benefits, I'm pleased that a new momentum is now really evident in the quest for transatlantic trade agreement. And as I said, in a world that changes with bewildering speed, this is uh, of enormous importance. For the past 12 months, we've sought to build up with a lot of others as support for the agreement. I've engaged extensively myself with political and business leaders both here and in the United States. I had the opportunity to raise the matter directly with uh, President Obama while visiting the White House last month. I also met with Vice President Biden and senior members of the US Senate and the US Congress. And I was pleased to hear of their commitment to advancing a transatlantic trade and investment partnership and a determination to succeed with the forthcoming negotiations. This country has always recognized the great potential in developing further trade links with the US. And since being elected to office here, I've prioritized developing these links and I've personally visited 11 US cities to help foster new trade and new opportunities. And even in the few short months since this country assumed the EU presidency, events have evolved and have moved forward rapidly. We now have clear political consensus, both in Europe and the US, about the benefits of a trade agreement and the imperative of ensuring successful conclusion to the negotiations. Both sides have now started internal procedures that will lead to the formal launch of negotiations at the earliest opportunity. Here in Europe, the draft mandate from the EU Commission was approved by the College of Commissioners, Commissioner here present, and transmitted to the European Council on the 12th of March. I met with the US Chamber of Commerce and Government Buildings this morning. I'm encouraged to hear that there has been further progress in Dublin here in the past two days. I understand that there's broad support throughout the member states to agree to seek a mandate at the Trade Council on the 14th of June and it remains our Presidency's very strong intention to do so. This means that the first round of negotiations could commence as early as uh, July. 
But it's important to understand that if you open negotiations on a mandate, to understand what it is that you want from them and what it is that can actually be achieved because the scale and the spectrum is exceptionally broad. We shouldn't lose sight in all of the political activity of the ultimate goal of such an agreement. What is it about? It's about creating new jobs for our people on both sides of the Atlantic. And this government that I lead and have the honour to lead was voted into office with a straightforward task to sort out the economic problems that we have here to get our country moving again. Two years ago, our economy was in free fall. 250,000 jobs had been lost. Unemployment was soaring. Public finances out of control. Banks on the brink of collapse. Country blocked out of the international bond markets and had suffered the ignominy of an EU IMF uh, bailout. Our international reputation was in shreds. We set out a plan for economic recovery and have been working with the people on that plan ever since. It's working. Confidence is returning. Investment is growing. Just a while ago, we had another um, bond sale of 500 million, um, short-term money, and 0.195%, which is the lowest ever. It's important. It's a signal of confidence. We understand acutely just how far we have to go in the scale of challenges that we face up front. Our economy has returned to modest growth for the first time in three years, and that's uh, three years running, which is an important signal. Private sector employment levels have grown by an average of 1,000 per month over the last 15 months, and unemployment has begun to fall. Admittedly, we have to deal with the consistent spectre of young people emigrating. There is, however, light at the end of this tunnel. And while the first two years of the government's plan prioritised uh, building stability, the focus of the plan now has to look and concentrate on a number of key areas, like continuing to make decisions to bring our national finances under control, working out a legacy, a distressing legacy, of personal and mortgage debt, creating badly needed jobs for our people, and continuing to implement long overdue changes to our public services and to our political system. Restoring Ireland's reputation for responsible financial management is at the heart of the plan to get Ireland working again. It is quite critical, obviously, for job creation and for investment. Now, over nine separate Troika analyses, we've implemented every single condition of the IMF EU programme and implemented them in full. The correction of the public finances is on track. The reduction of the deficit is on target. Over 80% of the fiscal consolidation is complete, and we will ensure that our borrowing falls below the 3% of GDP by 2015. Long-term sustainability uh, depends upon this. And in order to cut interest rates and to attract more investment, we renegotiated the bailout agreement to reduce its cost. Interest rates, as I've said, have been cut on the EU bailout loans to reduce the long term and the long run cost by nine billion. And last week their maturities were extended to an average of over twenty years. People approved the stability referendum by vote, helping to restore confidence by guaranteeing Ireland's access to the backstop of the European stability mechanism. Long-term government bonds, long-term bonds, are now at less than 4%, down from over 14 some time ago. And by getting rid of the promissory notes and by liquidating Anglo-Irish Bank and Irish Nationwide, we've cut our borrowing requirements by 20 billion euro over the next 10 years. The surviving banks have been restructured, have been recapitalised, with new boards and new management teams. The bank guarantee has been ended. Some stakes in the banks have been sold. Deposits are returning to the banks and the emergency central bank funding is no longer needed. The mortgage and the personal debt crisis has been one of the most socially and economically uh, painful issues bequeathed to the country by a debt-fueled property boom and bust 
under previous times. To accelerate the work out of this crisis, we've had to put in place a new comprehensive framework to deal with these particular circumstances. We've enacted new personal insolvency legislation, details of which were announced today, to help distressed borrowers to reach settlements with their lenders while staying in their family homes. And banks that have not put in place sustainable solutions for families in long-term mortgage arrears by the end of next year will face serious financial sanctions. The consequence of implementing this plan is that we are now on course, now on course to exit the EU IMF programme by the end of this year, while sticking clearly to a plan of reducing borrowing and debt to sustainable levels. But we know, we know we have a long way to go. Financial stability and deficit reduction is but a means to our ultimate end, and that's restoring strong growth to employment and living standards. There are still far too many people without employment, without jobs. The biggest challenge facing this government is to reduce unemployment and get our people back to work. That problem exists right across Europe now. 26 million people unemployed. 26 million. In many countries and some countries serious levels of youth unemployment in particular, which is most distressing and indeed carries with it the seeds of serious unrest. My vision for a number of years has been to demonstrate and prove that we make this the best small country in the world in which to do business by 2016. It's important to understand that becoming the best location for business and enterprise is not an end in itself. It's not for the sake of business that this must be done. It's for the sake of the people. It's for them. And only a successful and a thriving environment can provide the kind of opportunities and to unleash the creativity that people demand. The jobs from a growing economy can support their dreams, fuel their ambitions, and of course, provide for their families. To this end, for American investors in particular, for anybody else interested, We've protected and maintained and will maintain our 12.5% rate of corporate tax and as a consequence in terms of the success of the Industrial Development Authority uh, and Enterprise Ireland, they both supported companies uh, more this year, last year, than in any year since 2006. We've cut Social Security taxes and employment and VAT and labour intensive services. We have protected public subsidies for research and innovation, and we believe in flexibility in building employment experience. We've also kept a commitment not to increase taxes on work and on income. This is essential for making work pay, for demonstrating that it pays to work, and for Ireland's international attractiveness as a location for investment. In fixing the mistakes of the past, we are building the Irish economy by transitioning it from a failed model based on property speculation, banking and debt to a sustainable economy based on enterprise, on innovation and on exports. The driver of the reform is the Central Action Plan for Jobs produced annually. Last year we managed to successfully implement 92% of the 270 actions contained in that programme, directed by uh, Minister Bruton, designed to make it easier for employers to protect and to create jobs. We've announced a further in excess of 300 actions uh, for this year in this uh, year's action plan. We announced recently a 2.25 billion stimulus in job-rich public infrastructure projects. We we'll legislate shortly for a six billion strategic investment fund to finance commercial investment projects in the Irish economy. We're bringing our welfare system into the 21st century to provide extra supports, <coughs> extra incentives for the unemployed to encourage them to take up job and retraining opportunities and we will no longer tolerate an outdated passive system that fails both the unemployed and fails the state. We have reformed restrictive labour market practices. We have overhauled 
sectoral wage setting mechanisms and we've liberalized what were previously closed professions. Cost competitiveness has as a consequence improved by over 20% since 2009 compared to many other countries in the European Union. We're now ranked by independent studies as the second most attractive country globally for foreign direct investment and we are ranked first in order in the Eurozone for the ease of doing business and first indeed globally for the availability of skilled labour. This country, ladies and gentlemen, is on the hard road to recovery. It has not been easy and it is not easy for the Irish people and there is still a difficult journey ahead. But I believe deep down that our plans working, people's sacrifices beginning to pay dividends, there is a growing support for and confidence in Ireland's economic future and our progress can be seen as a model for others. That's why in this day and age it's even more important that European leaders have to step up to the mark, have to show leadership, cooperation and courage in dealing with debt problems, the requirement for banking union and a real focus on growth and creativity in sorting out unemployment rates with particular reference to young people. We do not need another generation of young people without hope. Now is the time, therefore, to make the big changes that are necessary to ensure that economic recovery is both sustainable and long-term. The same is true for Europe and for America. The signing of a free trade agreement between our continents would be a major part in building a more sustainable economy for all our people. And that's to provide the next generation with more jobs and with the promise of fulfilling careers. That is the legacy that we can leave them today by making this agreement a reality. I started by speaking about Boston on the 28th of June 1963. Fifty years ago, another Bostonian came to this city and spoke to our parliament. President Kennedy said that Ireland was an extraordinary country and he said that, Ireland, that Ireland's hour had come, that it had something to offer and that was peace and freedom to the world of that time. Ireland's hour has come again in the form of the presidency of the European Union and it's our ambition to have the mandate to create something quite extraordinary in the securing of approval to negotiate the agreement for free trade between the uh, Union and our colleagues in the United States. I believe and have believed for many years that this new chapter in the relationship between Europe and America can certainly be the turning point for two extraordinary uh, economies with massive potential. Therefore, this is the time for leadership for belief and for conviction. And all of you who have a part to play in this, I ask you to put your shoulders to the wheel so that we can turn that wheel in the interests of two continents and 700 million people. Thank you very much.